Hello out there. It's a sunny Friday here in unincorporated Gladstone, and this is White Ash Flies with Carl Mahoney. I hope you've had a good week, and thank you so much for tuning in for this reading of The Brothers, written by William Wordsworth in 1800. I owe my appreciation of Wordsworth to a couple lectures I came across long ago by the British poet Basil Bunting. In these lectures, which were edited and published by Peter Macon, as Basil Bunting on Poetry, Bunting makes the case that rather than being a romantic, Wordsworth is actually a part of a longer trend in literature toward realism, as we know it. The portrayal of real, observed life, and of real people rather than costumed mannequins and caricatures. Bunting selected The Brothers, today's poem as representative of Wordsworth's realism, which drew much of its energy and life from his diction, his ear for the words and music of common speech. Bunting writes, Wordsworth did not write dialect, but he composed aloud, very loud according to the anecdotes, in the language he spoke, in his northern English accent, which was so thick that his friends John Keats and Samuel Coleridge found his conversation hard to follow. The brothers, today's reading, mainly consists of a dialogue between an elderly priest who serves the mountain village of Ennerdale and Leonard, returned home after long absence, incognito, to reunite with his beloved mountains and his beloved brother, James, and the poem opens with the priest wondering aloud to his wife about this stranger standing in the graveyard, whom he takes for a tourist. You can find this and older episodes of White Ash Flies on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Anchor FM, and Acast. And you can find me on Twitter at Colin Mahoney15. And now... The Brothers on White Ash Flies. These tourists, heaven preserve us, needs must live a profitable life. Some glance along, rapid and gay, as if the earth were air, and they were butterflies to wheel about long as the summer lasted. Some, as wise, perched on the forehead of a jutting crag, pencil in hand and book upon the knee, will look and scribble, scribble on and look, until a man might travel twelve stout miles, or reap an acre of his neighbor's corn. But for that moping son of idleness, why can he tarry yonder? In our churchyard is neither epitaph nor monument, tombstone nor name, only the turf we tread and a few natural graves. To Jane, his wife, Thus spake the homely priest of Ennerdale. It was a July evening, and he sat upon the long stone seat beneath the eaves of his old cottage, as it chanced that day, employed in winter's work. Upon the stone his wife sat near him, teasing matted wool, while from the twin cards toothed with glittering wire he fed the spindle of his youngest child, who, in the open air, with due accord of busy hands and back and forward steps, her large round wheel was turning. Towards the field in which the parish chapel stood alone, girt round with a bare ring of mossy wall, while half an hour went by, the priest had sent many a long look of wonder, and at last, risen from his seat, Beside the snow-white ridge of carded wool which the old man had piled, he laid his implements with gentle care, each in the other locked. And down the path that from his cottage to the churchyard led, he took his way, impatient to accost the stranger, whom he saw still lingering there. T'was one well known to him in former days, a shepherd lad, who, ere his sixteenth year, had left that calling, tempted to entrust his expectations to the fickle winds and perilous waters, with the mariners a fellow mariner. 
and so had fared through twenty seasons. But he had been reared among the mountains, and he in his heart was half a shepherd on the stormy seas. Oft in the piping shrouds had Leonard heard the tones of waterfalls, and inland sounds of caves and trees. And, when the regular wind between the tropics filled the steady sail, and blew with the same breath through days and weeks, lengthening invisibly its weary line along the cloudless main, he, in those hours of tiresome indolence, would often hang over the vessel's side, and gaze and gaze. And, while the broad blue wave and sparkling foam flashed round him images and hues that wrought in union with the employment of his heart, he, thus by feverish passion overcome, even with the organs of his bodily eye, below him, in the bosom of the deep, saw mountains, saw the forms of sheep that grazed on verdant hills, with dwellings among trees, and shepherds clad in the same country gray which he himself had worn. And now, at last, from perils manifold, with some small wealth acquired by traffic mid the Indian Isles, to his paternal home he has returned, with a determined purpose to resume the life he had lived there, both for the sake of many darling pleasures, and the love which to an only brother he has borne in all his hardships, since that happy time when, whether it blew foul or fair, they too were brother shepherds on their native hills. They were the last of all their race, and now, when Leonard had approached his home, his heart failed in him, and, not venturing to inquire tidings of one so long and dearly loved, he to the solitary churchyard turned, that, as he knew in what particular spot his family were laid, he thence might learn if still his brother lived, or to the file another grave was added. He had found another grave, near which a full half-hour he had remained. But, as he gazed, there grew such a confusion in his memory that he began to doubt, and even to hope that he had seen this heap of turf before, that it was not another grave, but one he had forgotten. He had lost his path, as up the vale that afternoon he walked through fields which once had been well known to him. And, oh, what joy this recollection now sent to his heart! He lifted up his eyes, and, looking around, imagined that he saw a strange alteration wrought on every side among the woods and fields, and that the rocks and everlasting hills themselves were changed. By this the priest, who down the field had come, unseen by Leonard, at the churchyard gate stopped short, and thence, at leisure, limb by limb perused him with a gay complacency. Aye, thought the vicar, smiling to himself, "'tis one of those who needs must leave the path of the world's business to go wild alone. His arms have a perpetual holiday. The happy man will creep about the fields following his fancies by the hour to bring tears down his cheek or solitary smiles into his face, until the setting sun right full upon his forehead. Planted thus beneath a shed that overarched the gate of this rude churchyard, till the stars appeared the good man might have communed with himself, but that the stranger, who had left the grave, approached. He recognized the priest at once, and, after greetings interchanged, and given by Leonard to the vicar as to one unknown to him, this dialogue ensued. You live, sir, in these dales, a quiet life. Your years make up one peaceful family. And who would grieve and fret if, welcome come and welcome gone, they are so like each other they cannot be remembered? Scarce a funeral comes to this churchyard once in eighteen months. And yet, 
some changes must take place among you. And you who dwell here, even among these rocks, can trace the finger of mortality and see that with our threescore years and ten we are not all that perish. I remember, for many years ago I passed this road. There was a footway all along the fields by the brookside. Tis gone. And that dark cleft, to me it does not seem to wear the face which then it had. Nay, sir, for aught I know, that chasm is much the same. But surely, yonder. Aye, there, indeed, your memory is a friend that does not play you false. On that tall pike, it is the loneliest place of all these hills, there were two springs which bubbled side by side, as if they had been made that they might be companions for each other. The huge crag was rent with lightning. One hath disappeared. The other, left behind, is flowing still. For accidents and changes such as these, we want not store of them. A water spout will bring down half a mountain. What a feast for folks that wander up and down like you to see an acre's breadth of that wide cliff, one roaring cataract. A sharp May storm will come with loads of January snow, and in one night send twenty score of sheep to feed the ravens. Or a shepherd dies by some untoward death among the rocks. The ice breaks up and sweeps away a bridge. A wood is felled. And then for our own homes, a child is born or christened, a field plowed, a daughter sent to service. A web spun. The old house clock is decked with a new face. And hence, so far from wanting facts or dates to chronicle the time, we all have here a pair of diaries, one serving, sir, for the whole dale, and one for each fireside. Yours was a stranger's judgment. For historians, commend me to these valleys. Yet your churchyard seems, if such freedom may be used with you, to say that you are heedless of the past. An orphan could not find his mother's grave. Here's neither head nor footstone, plate of brass, crossbones nor skull, type of our earthly state nor emblem of our hopes. The dead man's home is but a fellow to that pasture field. Why, there, sir, is a thought that's new to me. The stonecutters, tis true, might beg their bread if every English churchyard were like ours. Yet your conclusion wanders from the truth. We have no need of names and epitaphs. We talk about the dead by our firesides. And then, for our immortal part, we want no symbols, sir, to tell us that plain tale. The thought of death sits easy on the man who has been born and dies among the mountains. Your dalesmen, then, do in each other's thoughts possess a kind of second life. No doubt you, sir, could help me to the history of half these graves. For eight score winters past, with what I've witnessed and with what I've heard, perhaps I might. And on a winter evening, if you are seated at my chimney's nook, by turning o'er these hillocks one by one, we too could travel, sir, through a strange round. Yet all in the broad highway of the world... Now there's a grave. Your foot is half upon it. It looks just like the rest. And yet that man died broken-hearted. Tis a common case. We'll take another. Who is he that lies beneath yon ridge, the last of those three graves? It touches on that piece of native rock left in the churchyard wall. That's Walter Eubank. He had as white a head and fresh a cheek as ever were produced by youth and age engendering in the blood of hail fourscore. Through five long generations had the heart of Walter's forefathers o'erflowed the bounds of their inheritance. That single cottage, you see it yonder, in those few green fields. They toiled and wrought, and still from sire to son each struggled, and each yielded as before a little, yet a little. And old Walter, they left to him the family heart, and land with other burthens than the crop it bore. 
Year after year the old man still kept up a cheerful mind, and buffeted with bond, interest, and mortgages. At last he sank, and went into his grave before his time. Poor Walter! Whether it was care that spurred him, God only knows. But to the very last he had the lightest foot in Ennerdale. His pace was never that of an old man. I almost see him tripping down the path with his two grandsons after him. But you, unless our landlord be your host tonight, have far to travel. And on these rough paths, even in the longest day of midsummer. But those two orphans. Orphans? Such they were. Yet not while Walter lived. For, though their parents lay buried side by side as now they lie, the old man was a father to the boys, two fathers in one father. And if tears shed when he talked of them where they were not, and hauntings from the infirmity of love, are aught of what makes up a mother's heart, this old man, in the day of his old age, was half a mother to them. If you weep, sir, to hear a stranger talking about strangers, heaven bless you when you are among your kindred. Ay, you may turn that way. It is a grave which will bear looking at. These boys, I hope they love this good old man. They did, and truly. But that was what we almost overlooked. They were such darlings of each other. Yes, though from the cradle they had lived with Walter, the only kinsman near them, and though he inclined to both by reason of his age, with a more fond, familiar tenderness, they, notwithstanding, had much love to spare, and it all went into each other's hearts. Leonard, the elder by just eighteen months, was two years taller. T'was a joy to see, to hear, to meet them, from their house the school is distant three short miles, and in the time of storm and thaw, when every watercourse and umbridge stream, such as you may have noticed crossing our roads at every hundred steps, was swollen into a noisy rivulet, would Leonard then, when elder boys remained at home, go staggering through the slippery fords, bearing his brother on his back? I have seen him on windy days in one of those stray brooks, Ay, more than once I have seen him, mid-leg deep, their two books lying both on a dry stone upon the hither side. And once I said, as I remember, looking round these rocks and hills on which we all of us were born, that God who made the great book of the world would bless such piety. It may be, then. Never did worthier lads break English bread. The very brightest Sunday autumn saw, with all its mealy clusters of ripe nuts, could never keep those boys away from church, or tempt them to an hour of Sabbath breach. Leonard and James. I warrant, every corner among these rocks, and every hollow place that venturous foot could reach, to one or both was known as well as to the flowers that grow there. Like roebucks they went bounding o'er the hills. They played like two young ravens on the crags, then they could write, aye, and speak, too, as well as many of their betters. And for Leonard, the very night before he went away, in my own house I put into his hand a Bible, and I'd wager house and field that, if he be alive, he has it yet. It seems these brothers have not lived to be a comfort to each other. That they might live to such end is what both old and young in this our valley all of us have wished, and what, for my part, I've often prayed. But, Leonard, then James still is left among you. Tis of the elder brother I am speaking. They had an uncle. He was at that time a thriving man, and trafficked on the seas. And, but for that same uncle, to this hour Leonard had never handled rope or shroud, for the boy loved the life which we lead here. And though of unripe years, a stripling only, his soul was knit to this his native soil. But, as I said, old Walter was too weak to strive with such a torrent. When he died, the estate and house were sold, and all their sheep, 
a pretty flock, and which, for aught I know, had clothed the Eubanks for a thousand years. Well, all was gone, and they were destitute. And Leonard, chiefly for his brother's sake, resolved to try his fortune on the seas. Twelve years are past since we had tidings from him. If there were one among us who had heard that Leonard Eubank was come home again, from the great gavel down by Lisa's banks, and down the Enna far as Egremont, the day would be a joyous festival. And those two bells of ours, which you see there, hanging in the open air. But, oh, good sir, this is sad talk. They'll never sound for him, living or dead. When last we heard of him, he was in slavery among the Moors upon the Barbary coast. It was not a little that would bring down his spirit, and no doubt, before it ended in his death, the youth was sadly crossed. Poor Leonard! When we parted, he took me by the hand and said to me, If ere he should grow rich, he would return, to live in peace upon his father's land, and lay his bones among us. If that day should come, t'would needs be a glad day for him. He would himself, no doubt, be happy then as any that should meet him. Happy? Sir, you said his kindred were all in their graves, and that he had one brother. That is but a fellow tale of sorrow. From his youth, James, though not sickly, yet was delicate, and Leonard, being always by his side, had done so many offices about him, that, though he was not of a timid nature, yet still the spirit of a mountain boy in him was somewhat checked. And when his brother was gone to sea, and he was left alone, the little color that he had was soon stolen from his cheek. He drooped, and pined and pined. But these are all the graves of full-grown men, I, sir, that passed away. We took him to us. He was the child of all the dale. He lived three months with one and six months with another, and wanted neither food nor clothes nor love. And many, many happy days were his. But, whether blithe or sad, tis my belief his absent brother still was at his heart. And, when he dwelt beneath our roof, we found, a practice till this time unknown to him, that often, rising from his bed at night, he in his sleep would walk about, and sleeping he sought his brother Leonard. You are moved. Forgive me, sir. Before I spoke to you, I judged you most unkindly. But this youth, how did he die at last? One sweet May morning, it will be twelve years since when spring returns. He had gone forth among the new-dropped lambs, with two or three companions, whom their course of occupation led from height to height under a cloudless sun, till he, at length, through weariness, or, happily, to indulge the humor of the moment, lagged behind. You see yon precipice. It wears the shape of a vast building made of many crags, and in the midst is one particular rock that rises like a column from the vale, whence by our shepherds it is called the Pillar. Upon its airy summit, crowned with heath, the loiterer, not unnoticed by his comrades, lay stretched at ease. But, passing by the place on their return, they found that he was gone. No ill was feared, till one of them by chance entering when evening was far spent, the house which at that time was James's home, there learned that nobody had seen him all that day. The morning came, and still he was unheard of. The neighbors were alarmed, and to the brook some hastened. Some ran to the lake. Ere noon they found him at the foot of that same rock, dead, and with mangled limbs. The third day after I buried him, poor youth, and there he lies, and that, then, is his grave. Before his death, you say that he saw many happy years. Aye, that he did. And all went well with him. If he had one, 
the youth had twenty homes. And you believe, then, that his mind was easy? Yes. Long before he died, he found that time is a true friend to sorrow, and unless his thoughts were turned on Leonard's luckless fortune, he talked about him with a cheerful love. He could not come to an unhallowed end. Nay, God forbid. You recollect I mentioned a habit which disquietude and grief had brought upon him, and we all conjectured that, as the day was warm, he had lain down on the soft heath, and, waiting for his comrades, he there had fallen asleep. That in his sleep he to the margin of the precipice had walked, and from the summit had fallen headlong, and so no doubt he perished. When the youth fell, in his hand he must have grasped, we think, his shepherd's staff, for on that pillar of rock it had been caught midway, and there for years it hung and mouldered there. The priest here ended. The stranger would have thanked him, but he felt a gushing from his heart that took away the power of speech. Both left the spot in silence, and Leonard, when they reached the churchyard gate, as the priest lifted up the latch, turned round, and, looking at the grave, he said, My brother. The vicar did not hear the words, and now he pointed towards his dwelling place, entreating that Leonard would partake his homely fare. The other thanked him with an earnest voice, but added that, the evening being calm, he would pursue his journey. So they parted. It was not long ere Leonard reached a grove that overhung the road. He there stopped short, and, sitting down beneath the trees, reviewed all that the priest had said. His early years were with him, his long absence, cherished hopes, and thoughts which had been his an hour before, all pressed on him with such a weight that now, this vale where he had been so happy, seemed a place in which he could not bear to live. So he relinquished all his purposes. He traveled back to Egremont, and thence, that night, he wrote a letter to the priest, reminding him of what had passed between them, and adding, with a hope to be forgiven, that it was from the weakness of his heart he had not dared to tell him who he was. This done, he went on shipboard, and is now a seaman, a grey-headed mariner,